Good morning. I'd like to thank Richard Waterhouse and the team at NBS for this opportunity to speak to you today about technology's role in the next decade of industry transformation. We've seen lots of change in the last 20 years as digital technology has evolved in the building industry. And I'd like to speculate today for a few minutes about where we might be headed over the next 10 years. Now, up to this point, the history of technology, at least technologies that are used to depict information that's transmitted in the building industry from designers to builders to building operators, been pretty straightforward. It's a, it's a clear history. For several thousand years, we recorded lots of information on pieces of paper. Uh, that was a great abstraction mechanism for taking a big complicated thing like a building and telling people about it and memorializing that information and moving it from place to place. Uh, in the late 20th century, we translated that technique from an analog process to a digital process where we drew on digital pieces of paper and then used machines to print those pieces of paper out, but we didn't make a dramatic shift in the means of representation. In the early 20th century, however, we did make a break, a paradigmatic break in the way information was represented and transmitted in the building industry. And that break uh, was building information modeling, an idea that drove the manifestation of information in three-dimensional format in a digitally provocative, behaviorally interesting, in theory, well-organized digital simulation of a building. But as we approach the middle of the 21st century, technologies like cloud computing and the internet have dramatically increased the digital power of representation and the kinds of tools that are available to our industry. And as a consequence, we're able now to enter into what I suspect will be a kind of fourth mode of technology in the building industry, which I'm going to call integrated digital delivery. And integrated digital delivery is a proxy for a state where information across the supply chain, across the disaggregated players that participate in the supply chain is easily accessible and thereby gives us a broader view of what's happening from the beginning of a project to the end of a project. Now, the building industry, of course, today is starting to become uh, intensely digitized. Our friends from NBS every year issue a report where they describe the progress of building information modeling. And in their 2019 report, as they talked about some advanced technologies, they speculated about some of the kinds of things that might be happening in the future as technologies like machine learning begin to evolve. And it, the, I think it's an interesting set of observations about where we might be going. But what we're lacking right now is a thesis about how all these technologies might come together to make this range of tasks like open data platforms and field-based operations possible. And I'd like to take the very first small step in that direction with the talk that we're gonna be having today for the next 20 minutes or so. So in 2018, I finished a book called Architecture, Design, Data, Practice Competency in the Era of Computation. And in that book, I speculated on how technology might be changing how we work in the building industry. And I drew a lot of diagrams that look like this one that should look familiar to you that suggest the cyclical nature of an idealized data state in the building industry, where designers using modeling tools that were supported by other models of other projects that they had made transmit information from their models to the builders who amplify the work that they do digitally in simulating the construction and managing the construction of the building with other information that they've accumulated from other projects that information is then transferred to the asset owner who can use it to manage that process and aggregate information about other projects. And then perhaps that information flows back to the designer in a kind of self-amplifying cycle, virtuous cycle of information. And, I, and the implication was that somehow building information modeling or some kind of a centralized repository of models or a single federated model was the answer to this particular dilemma. But what I'd like to suggest, however, is that in reality, we have a different circumstance happening. The, the patterning of digital work in the building industry, as I think beautifully exemplified here by the REVA 2020 plan of work, has channels. It has different tasks and activities. And those tasks and activities create information which is not always compatible. And then the structure of that information is not always compatible. 
And as we digitize more and more of our process, and we support more and more of the overall delivery of projects through digital tools, we end up with a, a, a larger problem, a larger dilemma of how things might come together. And in fact, this kind of concept of, this, of a consolidated building information model that's at the center of the process, I don't actually think is really the case. I think what we have is people using building information modeling tools to create their design concepts supported by other kinds of digital instruments. And as you progress through the process, the number of instruments uh, also progresses. And you have typologically different kinds of models, maybe design BIMs or what, frankly, I think most building information modeling is being used for today, production, creation of coherent working drawings. And in that sense, it's kind of a failure that BIM at level two is being used primarily to generate more coordinated uh, pre-digital artifacts like drawings. And then the con contractors take that information from that preliminary BIM or build a new BIM themselves, make a model for themselves that they need to construct the building. And then similarly, when we get to asset operations, what we've ended up with here is a whole series of different kinds of representations, extractions, organizations of information about, about a built asset that are only loosely correlated to one another through geometry and may not have had anything to do with one another as they were created. In fact, I think what we've got right now is a world of lots of little BIMs. And what we really want in some form is something more consolidated. Now you're starting to hear talk of a concept called digital twins, which as I understand it is some kind of anecdotal extraction of production BIMs, construction BIMs, operation BIMs to create a digital doppelganger of the building uh, as the building is operated as an asset, but it's not really a digital twin in any sense. It's just a, a collection of information that then gets augmented by data from the, from the um, building uh, operation system, the building sensors. But what, we're, what we really need is a, a concept of bigger BIM or, or what I'm calling integrated project delivery. And in order to get to that concept, at least from a technological point of view, we have to look a little bit more deeply into the array of tools that are available and how they might work toward this end. In its most important components in five stacks to create the information in three dimensions and form the backbone of the big BIM, the digital twin, the integrated delivery, the digital tools that we're starting to develop today that allow us to reason about that digital information, simulation, analysis, evaluative tools that are starting to pop up. And at this particular juncture, management tools are beginning to evolve that just help us with that data. And right now, we're all getting pretty comfortable with those first three stacks. But there are two other types of technologies. Generative designs are going to come into their own over the next 10 years. They're going to create not just representing geometry and data about a built artifact, but representing process service of creating that data or manipulating it. And then more importantly, machine learning and artificial intelligence, where not find relationships and drill amounts of information. And many of the strategies that we have today, starting with early IBM access platforms, are all attempts to oppose structures of data from the top down, but it may be possible using machine learning, find ways to consolidate the org access to be different that doesn't require this point would allow us to opt up data. And so what we might be looking at in actualizing the idea of a different around the enterprise, a series of algorithms instead of algorithms for machine learning and, and, and artificial intent information in a broader sense and give us a bigger view then is use these tools to represent, evaluate, and reason about them, can find it, just systematic ways, explore. As machine learning platforms apply their neural networking us to this constellation of data, we'll be, be able to, at least in my view, understand it, organize it, access it of ideas. And so all the, the emergence of all these digital tools at this point, including the top three in the stack and the bottom two in the stack, are starting to form a forward that are all being deployed in the, in the service of some form of integration. And the technological uh, aspects of that looking for is a way to improve the building industry and its outputs in, in ways that between the players, and you're already starting to have Mesa's jump factories to a really interesting idea about pre-planning the use of industrialized construction techniques to build a factory that on site that actually builds a building is a type of sort of super integration with control of design process, manufacturing strategy, material flows, labor organization, and an and attempt to apply a whole series of different kinds of supply chain ideas to move a project forward. Uh, there's an image of that here on the left. On the right are some diagrams coming out of a research project that we're conducting between Yale University and the University of Washington to study the 
integration of different kinds of new players in the building industry. And we were able by looking at the North American market to pretty quickly make a list of about 50 or 60 players in the industry who are crossing the traditional boundaries of design, construction, approvals, building operation and building ownership in ways that are not um, particularly legible right now. You have firms like Katera that are trying to control the entire supply chain. You have contractors like Mace or Skender that are doing on-site uh, manufacturing and outsourcing inspection. We're, we're trying in this study, and you can see this, uh, some of the sample diagrams here on the right, to see if we can see some patterns in this episodic integration that's going on and try to understand why companies take on these patterns. Are they trying to position themselves in a unique way in the marketplace? Are they trying to reduce risk? Are they trying to improve productivity? Is there new, some kind of new value proposition? The digital tools are making these relationships possible. We're trying to understand why the firms as individual firms are doing it. But the building industry itself has got to begin now to face some of these much larger issues that society is facing. And we've got to start operating in a way that's in the service of some of these larger kinds of problems. And the, the, there is a thesis out there that says you need a combination of technological ideas, organizational strategies, and the right environmental conditions to get to innovation. And I would argue that the, the stack of technologies that I described earlier, the environmental conditions that are really pushing us in the building industry to improve environmental conditions, and the kinds of organizations that you see here in this study are making it possible for us to look at the built environment and the way we deliver it in a different way and attack the problems of how we work in, in, in different, using different strategies and with different approaches. And there really couldn't be a better time to look at this problem because the, in a sense that the building industry is, has, a, has a fundamental responsibility for the health, safety, and welfare of the people that are working on our job sites and the people that use our projects, there are some big challenges out there that cannot be solved unless we have a cross supply chain perspective on this problem. For example, climate change, climate change being driven by carbon, carbon being a, an element that is embedded in many of the decisions that we make across the supply chain integration that delivers a building. This is the architecture from Kieran Timberlake's tool that they built with Autodesk called Tally, which looks across the delivery strategy for a project and evaluates the potential embedded carbon in a design as it's being, as it's being developed. And so here you see a cross supply chain view looking at a, a particular challenge around climate change. The pandemic and the COVID-19 crisis has, has brought a whole other set of questions about health, safety, and welfare into the fore. This is how I spent my summer essentially attacking the problem of pandemic planning as an architectural issue. This is our iconic Paul Rudolph School of Architecture building at Yale University. We spent the entire summer analyzing how we were going to open this building under pandemic conditions in the fall, using a building information model, a series of analytical algorithms, and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. We figured out ways that we could open our building in a safe way, working closely with physicians from our medical school, public health experts from our School of Public Health, and, and really looking at through the lens of building operation and its relationship to design, which is another cross supply chain challenge. And then of course, a, a, an emergent problem that's been under the surface, but it's come to the fore um, really since the murder of George Floyd is social justice and questions about how the built environment plays a part in creating structures that are that create social inequity across the system. And like, like all other parts of the economy, the building industry plays a part in this question. This is an issue that's particularly of interest to our current generation of students. But until we understand the relationship of our buildings to the broader systems, economic systems of supply and demand, not just how we build them, but how they operate, we won't be able to play our part in improving the public health, safety, and welfare in this regard. And then, of course, there's this particularly vivid example of how the failure to understand the implications of the supply chain literally killed people in the case of the Grenfell disaster. And in this case, the disaggregation of the various processes of design, manufacturing, material selection, material specification, assembly, ins and inspection, in combination created a deadly situation. And it's clear that the through line from design through to installation, to inspection, to building operation is not well understood. 
And if we're really gonna get on top of the possibility that these kinds of disasters can be eliminated in the future, we've gotta have a better view of the overall integration of the process. And I think those five technologies that I talked about give us a way forward to begin to think about it. And then finally, there's a question that's been a topic of discussion in the UK since the Modern Slavery Act of 2015, but one that's starting to get a lot more attention is the labor implications of the overall supply chain. This is a course that I'm teaching with a former ambassador from the Obama administration, Lou DeVaca. We're teaching a seminar here at Yale this semester where we're trying to understand how enslaved labor supports the building supply chain and particularly how designers can make decisions that reduce that question. Again, a problem of understanding the integrated relationship between design decisions, construction activity, and the supply chain itself. And integrated delivery really becomes a question of understanding those kinds of relationships. This is a, a work that's done by my faculty colleague, Alan Organsky, who is working on the circular carbon economy. And his thesis being that, the, that forests can become the carbon sinks for wood-based construction in the city requires him to understand the complete relationship between the earth, forests, wood products, carbon, and how they are actually assembled into, into his buildings. And his, his design build firm actually uses the carbon supply chain as a constraint of their design process, but they work on relatively small projects and they have an excellent span of control over their supply chain. And these principles using data and the kinds of technological infrastructure that I've described become possible. And then here in my class, we're studying the sequence of decisions that become, that start with the idea that an owner has for a building and eventually end up enslaving a worker in the, in the Brazilian rainforest who chops down trees that become charcoal, that go in the smelters, that go to the iron suppliers, that allow the iron suppliers to create the pig iron, that goes to the steel fabricator, that eventually gets erected in the steel building that you decided as a designer two years previously was gonna be a steel frame building. And then uh, trying to have strategies that allow us to have a through line through this whole sequence, through data and through the relationships of the data sets that the various players create, I think is a, is a key to getting on top of these problems. Mm -hmm. So I wrote in my book in 2018 that I thought there were three questions that we needed to ask ourselves as participants in the building industry that can really attack these questions. And these questions started out as early as the Egan report of about issues of sustainability and efficiency, but they've really become much broader as I think I've just described to you. And what I'd said in my book is, we really needed to look at three sets of issues. The agency of the players in the delivery process and what their relationship is to the systems of delivery, the methods that they use to represent and transmit information and exchange risk and reward. And finally, the outputs or the value of those methods not just in terms of financial output, but in terms of results. And I've argued that the integration of the process and the use of the kinds of constellations of tools that we're talking about here can move our industry away from commoditized value propositions where we simply deliver drawings or deliver buildings or deliver materials for a fixed commodity price and tie our outputs to outcomes, to making things happen. And it's very clear that with the kinds of issues that I think I've raised today around social justice, or carbon, or labor, or safety, the outputs of our industry really need to improve. And we're finally getting to the point, at least in my view, where we have an array of technology that can begin to allow us to have this through line through the supply chain that can let us attack these kinds of problems in a responsible way. So I thank you for the opportunity to talk about some of these ideas and I look forward to our early morning, at least my time, uh, Q&A later this week. Thank you. <laughs>